I'm Barbara Peters. Welcome to this episode of The Criminal Calendar. We have an author who is a true globetrotter with us today, but luckily he is perching in Scottsdale long enough for us to do this interview. Dan Fisperman. Hi there. Hi. Nice to be here. A political a war correspondent? What do I want to call you? Uh, just a writer for now. I'm uh, no longer doing that for a living, but uh, it, it was a nice ride while it lasted. Being a did, war you do, did you do most of your work at the Baltimore Sun? I did. I was a journalist for goodness, must have been more than 30 years and more than 22 of them were at the Sun. And how do you get to be a war correspondent as compared to a reporter doing the mean streets of Baltimore? Uh, you, like most people who end up in war, you volunteer. Um, Ooh. So uh, there was, I was surprised that there weren't more volunteers actually because I had always, while I was in college, read a lot of uh, dispatches by war correspondents and collections and always had this fascination with the whole idea of being one so uh, when I got my first opportunity just before the Gulf War at 91 uh, I took I uh, jumped at that chance and that all produced a background material for your first novel Lie in the Dark right that uh, sprang out of my first trip to Sarajevo in the early winter of 94 when I got back I immediately got this idea for uh, using a lot of the material that I'd accumulated there, but uh, there's no way to force it into the types of stories newspapers wanted. Well, not only that, doesn't our newspaper stories structured almost to me in the reverse of a novel, in that you put all the big stuff in the sort of at the beginning? They are, but uh, they sent me there to do more narrative type pieces, which was actually conducive to researching a novel because I was doing the same type of research on characters, uh, on the types of places where people would go to ride things out, the way people were leading their lives day to day. So actually it was a big help to me in helping me get a look at the type of research I would need to do for a novel. Is that what they call, no, not op-ed, because that's more editorial right. stuff. But, you know, I often wonder if newspapers today have lost their way and in trying to do all the little sound bits and make themselves look like, you know, the Internet or whatever, they've forgotten that people who read newspapers actually want to read. Yeah, well, that's, you're absolutely right. I think where they've really gone astray is they're bending over backwards to try to appeal to non-readers, and they're just, it's not going to happen. People just aren't going to read newspapers who don't read. I think it's interesting to me that so seldom do people today seem to identify what their actual mission and who their real competitors are. I mm -hmm. mean, I can remember years ago when I started the bookstore and used to go to meetings of the American Bookseller Association, one of the constant themes that would come up was that um, independent booksellers would complain about all the great discounts that the chain bookstores got for best-selling authors. Mm -hmm. and they wanted a level play playing field, and I would keep saying, well, who cares? Yeah. It's not your author. You should be developing, well, Dan Fesperman, for mm -hmm. example. Yeah which, you know, before your first novel came out, you were an unknown product. Right. Um, and, and the answer I always got was that uh, they would have to read these new novels and make a judgment, and it was easier to, to deal with developed stuff. And I think newspapers have fallen into the same trap. Yeah, I think they have. They just don't realize that the people who really rely on them are people who would like to know more and would like to read longer, more in-depth stories. So the Baltimore Sun is still going, but there used to be more papers in Baltimore. Is the Sun really the only one The left? Sun is it. Uh, there used to be three. There were two Suns and a News American, but the Sun is it now, and it's uh, probably down from about 420-something newsroom employees to fewer than 300. So it's, it's, they used to have eight foreign bureaus. Now they have zero, and thank goodness that wasn't the case when I came along, or I wouldn't have gotten the chance to get all the seasoning and experience I got abroad. When you left, was it mostly because you were now an established writer publishing with Alfred A. Knopf, who presumably can afford to give you yeah. something to live on? Yeah. Yeah, that was why. I, I really wanted, once I started writing books, I wanted to do that full time. So as soon as I got in a position to be able to do that and possibly still send two kids to college, uh, I took that chance. Well, I know Laura Lippman was another person mm -hmm. on The Sun who has become a full-time writer. Did Stephen Hunter, another son of Baltimore, did he uh, publish with The Sun? Or he did. He? In fact, there was a time for a while when I was in features, and so was Laura, and so was Steve, where we were probably within about a 20-foot radius of each other, all our desks, and we were all working. Uh, I was working on my first book at the time. Laura, I think, was uh, coming out with her third, and Stephen Hunter was probably on about his fifth or sixth. So it was uh, quite a little warren of uh, scribblers in there. 
I think it's fascinating. It's sort of like the Miami uh, Herald, where mm -hmm. there were right. a whole bunch of writers. All I remember John Sanford has said to me he used to get in trouble with Edna Buchanan because he'd put his feet up on her desk. And, you know, <laughs> right. we had Carl Hyacinth and, right. you know, Dave Barry as the column. It's interesting how, I don't know whether it's the, it's the newspaper or the city or some synergy between them. I'm not sure. I think there are a lot of uh, would be novelists and frustrated novelists and novelists at newspapers. And I don't know if it's because they get tired of the constraints and the, and the conventions of what they have to do and want to do more, or if they just see it as a more glamorous profession or, or what it is. But uh, with me, and I think with Laura and with Stephen, we just felt like we had a lot more to write about, that uh, we could have a lot more fun writing novels. Although Steve still writes his movie reviews. He does. He's actually yeah. a wonderful movie yeah, critic. And I think his last book, uh, The 47 Samurai, is mm -hmm. interesting to me. He had published a whole bunch of books, and I thought The 47 Samurai was like, whoa, it's a whole mm -hmm. new writer. Yeah. I absolutely loved it. Yeah. And he and I correspond. We've taped this program together. Mm -hmm. And that did so much better, he said, than his books for quite a long time that he's now writing a sort of follow-up. Mm -hmm. um, as opposed to you, who has mm -hmm. done one one character twice. Yeah. But otherwise, you've been um, with different guys. Yeah, that's true. But I was going to finish up the newspaper thing by saying, in my experience, those of you who've been professional reporters tend to treat novel writing more like a job. You, you have like interior deadlines. Yeah, that's and, true. And you're more productive in general, more disciplined. Maybe it's because the years of writing on deadline kind of trains you. It's partly that. It's partly because I'm more productive anywhere than in a newsroom where there are such social places that you mm -hmm. constantly have the temptation to go, uh, you know, shoot the breeze with somebody, hash out a story with them. I would spend two, three hours a day, I realized, once I started writing on my own, uh, getting nothing done in the newsroom. Whereas once I went off to a foreign bureau in Berlin, and also once I'm at home and writing a novel, I, uh, it, I'm much more single-minded, I get much more done, uh, I can meet all my deadlines a lot easier. So in a way, I'm even more efficient than I was as a journalist. That's interesting, because I think some people really like that socialization and miss it. I, mean, I miss it, but uh, it's, uh, my work doesn't miss it. <laughs> so. Well, I have noticed you become more productive because there was quite a gap between Lie in the Dark, which you and I were just discussing, mm -hmm. we think was 1999. Yeah, it was. It was. Okay. And then you got to A Small Boat of Great Sorrows, what, in 2003? 2003 was when that was published. And it was a long gap because once I wrote my first novel, I think it was a bit of a shock to me how hard it was to get a first novel published. And I thought, well, if this is the case, I'm certainly not going to invest a year and a half, two years, whatever it takes to write another novel until I know that I want to. I, I think some people's response is, well, then I'll write another one and get it published. But I was headstrong enough where I felt like, well, this is good enough to be published, so I'll just wait and see. And if it's published, then I'll start on another one. You were taken up by a very interesting publishing company, yeah. Soho Press, who, with almost no exceptions, publishes books that are set in other countries. True, and that, they do a lot of translations, too. They do. Um, they, uh, we're having Peter Lovesey, who's one of the mm -hmm. people on their yeah. list, to see us very shortly at the Poison Pen. But I was thinking Rebecca Powell has done these wonderful yes. books about, um, actually, it's revolutionary Spain. Spain. Right. Uh, fascist and whatever, communist mm -hmm. Spain between the, or actually the aftermath thereof, right. which I like. Cara Black, who does the wonderful French mm -hmm. series. Who I just saw at the LA Times Book Festival, yeah. She's done extremely she well, is. and I love her idea of writing about different quarters of Paris, mm -hmm. so that basically you get to tour the city, and it's, right. um, maybe Paris has more distinct ethnic enclaves still than a lot of other cities. Yeah. Not sure, but anyway, she does that. Peter Lovesey, who writes British books, they have a new fellow writing about Palestine. Ben, yes, um, Matthew Rees. I think that's his name, yeah. Benyon yeah. Matthew Rees. In fact, I think yeah. he um, is a is a correspondent with the New York Times. Uh, but he's a correspondent over there with someone. Yeah, or Time true. Magazine. I'm I think it to might remember. be Time Magazine. Yeah. Uh, in fact, he I think he was head of the Jerusalem Bureau mm -hmm. right. for Time, and he has written two books for the um, in Palestine, which is really an interesting venue yes. with a school teacher kind of sleuth, and not the sort of person that you think would get into. Right. 